get my notes up. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance, Weekly Scrap, number 57. Special guest tonight is Ben Schultz. He comes from New Jersey originally, went to college in Florida, started in the fire service in 2004 in Southern California, then kind of moved halfway across the country to Colorado for 11 years, and then decided that's not far enough and took it to Florida, where he landed at West Palm Beach since 2016. He is a firefighter, paramedic, tell me if I get anything wrong, but firefighter, paramedic, worked on trucks, engines, heavy rescue, squad, medics. He has been a rescue tech, swift water tech, wildland task force member, and he has taught with some of the best, including Irons and Ladders, Vent Inner Search, and currently with one of my heroes, Brian Brush and Fire by Trade. So with all of that being said, oh, and then also if there's a conference you have heard of, Ben is taught at it. So I'll throw that out there. I won't even list them all. Uh, ben Schultz, it is my pleasure to have you on as a guest of Weekly Scrap number 57. Well, thank you, man. It's, uh, I'm, I'm honored. I, uh, I've seen quite a few of your episodes, uh, probably almost all of them, and, and you, you have an outstanding, uh, outstanding group of individuals on here, so I'm, I'm honored to be uh, in the list with them. So, Dude, I have Thanks for having me. One yeah. of the luckiest guys in the fire service and the people I get to talk to each week. So, <laughs> and, and no exception today. So I'm very excited for today's talk. Um, to everyone watching live, if you have questions for Ben or myself, that's one of the things I love the most about the scrap is the questions you guys send. So please think about questions you want answers to and throw them at us. Uh, don't hesitate to send them in the comments so I can throw them at Ben. Um, did I miss anything in the intro? Anything you want to add? No, that's plenty. That's okay. that plenty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then we'll kick it off because I'm going to start off right with, uh, I think this is a stranger to no one, the craziness that is 2020. And how has it affected the fire service where you're at? How has it affected you? Uh, <clears throat> as far as the fire service, or at least at least my department, I mean, I could, that's what I could speak to. Um, it's it's definitely been different. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it's changed quite a bit. It's evolved a lot from uh, March until now. Uh, just because it was it was so new, no one had any information. To I'm go gonna grab you back. real quick. The uh, yeah. mic is bumping on your chest, oh, right. and it is getting kind of distracting from what you're saying. Go we ahead. Want that. No, okay. no. So uh, yeah, so it's you know as as uh, we've learned more, we've we've evolved, but um, it's you know we got busy. We certainly got uh, busier with with uh, COVID calls, but we in the, in the kind of early stages of all this, we actually saw quite a bit, uh, of a drop, the drop down. Um, uh, yeah. In, in all the other calls, it seemed like people, uh, people stopped calling for the frivolous stuff. They kind of figured out how to manage their, uh, the small problems on their own, which was, which was nice for a change. Uh, that's kind of come back around though. Sure. So now we're back to <laughs> back through the uh, toothache calls and the, yeah, the hangnails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, but, uh, my department's weathered it pretty well. We've, uh, our admins done a really good job with it. And, um, so fortunately for our department, we haven't had a lot of cases. We've had a few, uh, for our members, uh, despite being surrounded by it. Sure. Florida is definitely a hot spot for, uh, for cases. So, um, you know, it's like anything else you adapt to it and, and, uh, and you keep rolling with the punches. The story across the country is just adapt and yeah. overcome and deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. So 100 percent All right. So I want to start off right at the beginning because you do a lecture titled Every Second Counts. And so I love this topic and I want to deep dive into it with you. So go ahead and just give the introduction to what it is all about. Even though the title is is if you haven't figured out what it's about, but go ahead. <laughs> sure. It's um <clears throat> so obviously it's time it's time based. I mean that's that's the theme of the entire uh, lecture, um, is how do, how do we get faster at what we do? And, uh, and the reason time became kind of so important to me, um, I looked at, <clears throat> I looked at what, you know, where can we really have a, a dramatic effect, uh, on the public? And if you look at, you know, if we, if we look at the, the different factors that go into civilian fire death, right. They either die from um, thermal insult, right. Or they die from smoke inhalation and smoke right. inhalation makes up the, the massive majority of it. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at all the factors that go into it, 
you know, you have to look at their proximity to the fire. You have to look at uh, uh, their elevation within the, the space, right? Um, the concentration of either smoke or heat that they take in, the dose or the amount. Um, and then and then their, their own physiology of each victim and their sure, comorbidities sure. and all that stuff. So there's so many factors that go into their outcome, right, into their survival. And, and for the most part, us as a fire service, we can't affect any of them. I, I don't get to pick where they are in that building, right? right I don't get right. to pick how close they are to the fire if they're in their bed or laying on the floor. Um, I don't get to pick if they're, you know, obese and, or have respiratory problems already, any of that stuff. What I, what I can affect is uh, the duration that they have to um, take in either that heat or that smoke. Right. right. By being better at my job. And um, so the faster I am at that, that's that's the one factor that we can really, really affect. You know, and when we when I started looking at that. Um, it, it, it just kept driving towards, you know, how do we be more aggressive, more aggressive, more aggressive, which at the time um, and still today, you know, I think it's it's starting to level off. But aggressive was like kind of becoming a bad word right right becoming a four letter word um basically you know and because we were just getting into this battle this this divisive battle that we seem to seems to be in everything in society right now but um of us versus them right, right. who comes first the who, fire who, service yeah. who's most important right? and and you had to pick a side you could you couldn't be in the <laughs> middle right but the fact is is we have we have the same enemy Right. The fire service and the public, the unprotected public have the same enemy and it's and it's time. Time. Right. So if I look at it from our perspective, what's the number one uh, cause of injury and the number one fatality cause of fatalities on the fire ground? It's overexertion for us. Right. So our clock starts as soon as I put on that gear. Right. Immediately, my heart rate is going up. My respiratory rate's going up. Uh, more and more important they're finding out my core temperature is going up and my skills and my cognitive abilities are all diminishing. They're all, they're all tanking from the minute I get dressed in the, in the Bay. Right. So the faster I mitigate the problem, the less I'm in that gear, the less I'm, I'm exposed to obviously potential of flash over some violent, you know, fire event or structural collapse. So time is our, our enemy as much as, as theirs, just for different reasons. Right on. So if we have the same enemy, then we can have the same solution, and that's speed. So And the speed, um, that the, the rest of the course or the rest of the lecture kind of leads into how do we get faster. And for me, <clears throat> I'm a big believer in bringing uh, – bringing your experiences, personal experiences, hobbies, things like that into what you do. Um, I I think the fire service for a long time just kind of lived too much in its own bubble, maybe, um, without looking at other industry. I think that's fair. uh, um, And so for me, I I worked at a scuba shop in New Jersey for a number of years. Jersey's not typically thought of as like a destination (laughs) dive spot, Right. right? Uh, cold, uh, usually visibility is not great. It's all wreck diving. Um, so it's, it's a equipment intensive, uh, sometimes not very friendly environment, um, where you have to rely on your equipment, but you want to minimize how much that equipment affects you. Right. Sure. Um, so I took a lot from that come before I came into the fire service and then uh, further on, uh, in my college years and, and on to today, I got really heavy into rock climbing, ice climbing, alpine mountaineering. Okay. Um, and alpine mountaineering really steered me in this direction of this, this light and fast mentality. And the, and the mentality was, um, speed of safety, the faster you get up to the summit and then back down, the less you're exposed to avalanche rock fall, you know, things of that nature. Right. So the less time you're in the ideal age, the better. Right on. Um, so, and, and those guys, uh, the guys I learned from and mentors I had in that arena, I mean, they scrutinize every single thing they do down to the ounce and down to the second. And so taking those, you know, those two hobbies and those two passions and bringing them into what I do here, 
uh, seemed fairly natural. Right and um, so, it, the, like I said, the rest of the course kind of dials into how do we reduce weight? How do we reduce movement? Uh, how do we, uh, we can't give seconds back, but how do we, we lose less time right. for both Give less us. away. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. And so, you know, so far it seems like people like hearing it and <laughs> I say at, at some, at some point they won't, and, and then I'll get to spend more time with my family. And stuff. But no, a hundred percent, like you said, I mean, it's, it's such a resonating, uh, especially like you mentioned it before the us versus them we're kind of and the aggressive the word aggressive we're kind of i think we've because of efforts of people like you and well I, I could list a ton of guests on the scrap that have 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 fought this fight but uh i feel like we're we've turned the corner almost on the us versus them and it's no longer the the battle that it was does that make sense I'd, yeah i'd agree i'd agree i think a few years ago it's it started to change i actually think with a lot of with the um as UL has, has done better in their delivery. Dissemination. Of, uh, yeah. Of right. Their information. I think that's, that's actually probably helped quite a bit um, to kind of just to dispel some of those, those, uh, you know, those fear mongering. Sure. Sure. Facts, not fear <laughs> is, and all that. The, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, seems like a no brainer. That's what I was going to say is, is like every second counts. It seems like a no brainer. So I really wanted to ask, and I don't mean that in a way like, uh, it's not, but what I'm saying is, do you actually get pushback from people on it that, that are like, no, uh, I don't need to do this or, or what's the, yeah, go for it. I, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't say I get pushback. Um, it's, it's, it's been really, it's been well received, uh, better than I thought it would. Right. Um, it, it started with, uh, uh, Cody McInnes at, um, Aurora fire who runs the, uh, the mile high. He's one of the guys who, who coordinates the mile high fire okay. conference. Okay. Yeah. Um, who gave me an opportunity to do this lecture a couple of years ago and, and kind of blossomed from there. So I, I kind of owe him all this. Um, but it's, uh, no, I don't get a lot of pushback. I think it's a one, I think one thing that resonates about it is one, I'm a firefighter. Right. I, I'm not, I'm not a captain chief, you know, um, it's, this is, it's a message. And when you, if you go through the lecture, there's takeaways from it that as soon as you leave that conference as a, you could be your second day on the job, you have something to go work on and go make your fire ground better. Right on. If you're, if you're a training chief or an ops chief, you also leave with a way to maybe implement some change in your training and your approach um, to, to implement some of these changes and make your fire ground better. So I, it's not a really targeted audience. It scales it's really well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's actually the feedback that I never expected, but that's a lot of what I got. That's the welcome um, feed. That's the good feedback. Yeah. I, it, I remember going, the first conference I ever went to was uh, FDIC and it was like my third year at West Metro in Colorado and West Metro. I, it was a great department. I loved working at West Metro. Uh, I had a good, uh, good academy. Felt like I got a lot of good training out of it. Um, I was exposed to very good firefighters right off the bat, good officers. But when I went to FDIC, I, th I think it was my third year. Uh, it was also my first time outside my bubble. Sure. And it was, it was, you know, that was my, my epiphany of like, man, I, I don't know this job at all. Like, I thought I knew stuff. I don't know. Anything. There's so much I don't know. And, um, and it, which was great. And, and it's, it's my, probably my biggest piece of advice to anyone new on the job is, is get outside the walls of your department as soon as possible. Not because they're wrong, but right. because you need to know what else is out there. And, um, but one of the things I took away from it was I went to so many great classes, great lectures, but as a brand new guy, I, I left going, man, that stuff was great. And I can't implement any of that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. No, so, I don't think so it was really important to me to, you know, to be able to try and provide something that day one you could walk out of and, and, and be better with. And, uh, you know, hopefully it seems like it's worked out that way so far anyway. No, 100%. 100%. And it's funny. We had some guys went to Wichita Hot and they got taught some stuff up there, you know. 
hose handling techniques and things like that. And they brought them back to our department. They were young guys, you know, the fired up guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was not well received, not for, not for their fault. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then, of course, in my backyard is Brian Brush, who's a great guy. And like a month <laughs> after they did their thing, he came over and gave us a class. And yeah. I said to one of them, I'm like, man, he's he's awesome at explaining exactly what you guys were explaining. And it was terrible. It was terrible. Yeah. I, I had to apologize over and over for what I – because those guys <laughs> came back and tried to give it back. And then – so it yeah. was just – but that is the struggle of going to these conferences and coming back as a young guy and trying to share it, you know. That or, it is. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's still, why it's – those they, guys that they, went and gave that that went to that conference and gave it. If you see this, know that I felt terrible and I still do about how I handled that. So, all right, there Sorry. you go. You're a bit of atonement, but uh, that's why. So, for instance, the, the main the, the first example I start with in the lecture in terms of of saving time uh, is mask up, right? Which has become a very very popular. I mean, you can't get on a Facebook page without someone posting how fast we're masking up now or something. So. Um, and, and that's why I chose that one because there's not a firefighter in the country right now, uh, on duty that can't go get better at it. They don't need their crew. All they, they just need to be at their station, right? They just need their air pack and their gear. Um, and they can do as many reps as they want and get better at it. And just by doing that, you just made yourself so much faster at a number of, of skills because, any assignment we get, right, is just an assignment of a number of skills done in a, a sequential order, right? So Absolutely. mask up is almost all, always one of them, right? If I'm, if I'm fire attack, if I'm search, if I'm going to the roof, I got to mask up. So if I could dump 30 seconds off my mask up time, I just dump 30 seconds off of every one of those assignments. And so it's a really easy one to start with for, for basically anyone. Awesome. No, and I, I agree with you. Yeah. Starts there, starts the basics. As you put all those basics together, and then you start to realize how many seconds you can actually shave. Yeah. When absolutely. all of them count. So that's amazing, man. I love it. I'm going to catch it sometime too. So, all right. Uh, you mentioned bringing the laboratory studies to the street experience and marrying the two. We've already touched on UL and NIST, and, but uh, how has that been received when you do the lecture and, and just kind of how's that going? That is, I, I think it's going well. Um, I... You know, I'm definitely a bookworm in terms of the science side of the, the job. Um, I I think having started in Southern California, which my experience there, they take a very uh, – it, it's – what I've seen in the country, you know, the West Coast treats us much more like a, like a true profession. Uh, and I, I don't say that – I know it comes off wrong. I don't say that to I was demean. like, whoa, those are fighting words. Right. I know. I don't, I, there's, and, and I think if you don't experience it, it's, it's probably hard for me to, to, cause I don't mean it to demean anyone in the, you know, central part or the East coast. Um, there's just maybe a little more white collar approach to it. I would say that's probably a, a more fair assessment. Um, and maybe because of history, you know, the East coast has such an old rich blue collar history with sure. it. And that's, that's really grounded in it. Um, whereas the West is a little younger. So I, I think maybe that's where it comes from, but that's what I was initially exposed to. Um, I, and I th- also what feeds into that is the, the paramedic side of things, right? I mean, that's obviously, it's, that's an educational site. It's not just blue collar work at that point. Um, so when you take, you know, I really like taking the schooling side of things, the educational side of things, marrying them with the, the blue collar side and, I think that's when you find your best product. Bring and, it to you. Yeah, the, it, definitely worth buying into at that point. You can't yeah, so, yeah. So as soon as like I got introduced to the, the UL stuff, I really ate that up. At the same time, still doing hands-on classes and all the other stuff. Um, but you, you know, UL. I think it, it's it, in its early days. We kind of chuckled about it early, <laughs> right? Um, maybe didn't do the best job of how it is either how some of the experiments were formed or how the, the information was disseminated. They've gotten much better at it. Um, in my, it, in my opinion, and much more uh, effective at it, at least if it's not better. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you start to marry that with the information that we're now, you know, that we've been seeing from firefighter rescue survey, right. Which is based on information from boots on the ground you know, that's where you're, that's where we're seeing that blend. Right. And, and we we're starting to see that 
um, that marriage of the data that UL is coming up with, the numbers coming from uh, firefighter rescue survey, and we're, we're seeing similar times, you know, we're seeing similar results. And I think that's, that's when you know you're on the right track. And so that's how I try to approach it. You know, right I present on. some of the, the UL studies, uh, dive into the firefighter rescue stuff and then and bring it together and, and show where they're really starting to blend. Right. No, I get that completely, especially the firefighter rescue survey, man. We're starting to track yeah. the stuff that needs to be tracked, the saves. Absolutely. So, and, yeah, that, and, I, that's a wealth of knowledge. Those guys are doing absolutely amazing work. All right. I'm going to do one thing, try to do. This is quality of life. Can you take your the headset side and wrap it around your ear? It'll pick up the mic a little bit. Is that, We're going to try that. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. It may no. work. If nothing else, no, I got I, you looking a little goofier. <laughs> but uh, no, That's it's just it's it, you're a very animated talker, and it's it's picking. I up am. I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. I'm going to catch you up here. Dave Harms said one of the good ones, and he gave you four American flags. So Dave Harms is awesome. That's he's, uh, a, he's a West Metro guy. He's a gotcha. outstanding. Guy. Yeah. Eric Devereaux said Schultz is the best. One exclamation point. <laughs> Not Howard Reinwalt said he is an outstanding resource, and I'm assuming he's talking about you. And then Fire by Trade has chimed in and said, Ben, can you talk about your experience with the importance of being on air on the roof and your vent process time breakdown? Sure. Uh, yeah, being on air on the roof and the vent process. So that's where a lot of this started in terms of the, the times. Um, I think that's probably Rush. What he's getting at was uh, – at the time, <clears throat> uh, Brush was my lieutenant um, at the uh, when we worked at the central uh, truck station at West Metro. So we were an engine truck medic house and dive station. Um, it was uh, the third truck to go in service at West Metro. Uh, it was a new crew that had kind of been put together and still learning. Um, learning, you know, figuring each other out and figuring out our operations. And uh, one of the things we, Brian and I had had discussions about how fast does it take us to vent a roof? Two story, single family, you know, which is, there's a sea of them in Colorado in our, in our old district. Um, so we went out, we, we were fortunate enough that our station was at the training center. So we kind of had a playground behind the station, which was just a great place to work. Doesn't hurt the cause. Uh, no. So especially on weekends, you know, no staff would be there. We kind of had to run out of the place. So we, you know, take the truck out there and, um, and set it up and just, we, we partnered up for us. Vertical vent was on a residential was a two person operation. We were four person staff on the truck. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> we just went through different pairings of firefighters and, um, uh, different tool placements on the rig. We broke our timing was uh, how fast to get away from the rig, how fast to get the ladders up, how fast to get to the roof. We broke everything down into sections versus just a, a stop and a fin or a start sure. and finish. And uh, to figure out where, you know, where we could get faster, where we were losing time. More importantly, to start all that, something that, that Brian and uh, our captain at the time, Doug Hutchinson had, had, uh, had agreed upon was that uh, unlike, I think it's really at least at our department and, and most departments I know that have four person staffing on their trucks. If they're going to split their truck, they usually split officer and firefighter and then engineer and firefighter. Right. Right. Pretty common way to do it. Sure. Um, we had a fairly senior crew. We had a number of guys on the crew that were, were step up officers. It was, it was a really well trusted crew by, by Doug and Brian. And so they made the decision that when we were going to split, we were going to keep the two firefighters together. Nice. And then the officer and the engineer would work together. And the sole reason for that was we were pulling up on scene, packed up, ready to go, right? Those two firefighters could step off and get the most emergent assignment started right away. Just right away. Well, the officer still got to, you know, he's often going to talk to command or give out orders. The engineer still got to get his pack on, right? It was, it was a time suck. So, for the two and two two firefighters to pair up just made sense from yeah a, just a time freed standpoint. up that time right there instantly yeah absolutely so we started with that and then we just worked scenario after scenario well all right what if you grab this tool and I grab that tool 
what if we put, all right, let's move the hook to this side, the axe to this side, you know, we just kept different Tinkering, variations. Right. And, you know, what started as a, a five minute evolution turned into, you know, a, a three minute evolution. And it was, it was, that was kind of an epiphany for definitely for me, it's where a lot of this came from. And, and I think for us as a crew. Now, and when you pull 40%, able, man, I mean, that's, that's, just from yeah. analyzation and, and repetition, though, that's impressive. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's what he's getting at. It was a good day for us, for sure. <laughs> no doubt about it, man. So, yeah. uh, John Lockwood said, a true fire service professional. I always learn something from John. Ben that makes me a better fireman. Good stuff, fellas. Hi, John. I love John. <laughs> I miss you, Ben I- Schultz, from Ian Bruzenak. If I, if I mispronounce your names, I always say that I, I apologize. It's a firefighters podcast, so I apologize. Yeah. All right. Um, West Coast, Mountain Coast, and now the Southeast Coast. You have literally been a firefighter across the country. That's a fair statement. Yeah. So I know that every fire station is different. Every every fire ser- or, uh, department is different, and they're the same. But mm-hmm. the differences, as someone with your unique perspective – can you elaborate? Yeah, I'll try a little. The, the departments were very different, um, or at least the communities were. So mm-hmm. that 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 in itself kind of makes it a little bit of an apples to oranges right. uh, comparison. I, I started, I worked on a, I worked full time on an ambulance in, uh, for San Diego. Uh, and then I was a reserve firefighter out in uh, kind of East County, San Diego. So very rural, um, lots of wildland uh it started wildland experience out there we didn't run a lot of calls but what we ran were typically really high acuity because it was in the middle of nowhere and people were just driving off the sides of roads and you know things like that so um and we only had we had like you know it was like 17 stations only one of them was staffed and gotcha. we covered, covered 700 square miles you know <laughs> right it was it was very different um so I went, uh, went from there to Colorado, uh, West Metro, extremely professional organization. Uh, like I said, of, I think a really good blend of that kind of blue collar work ethic. Um, but with, uh, they really put a lot of, a lot of weight on professionalism, um, on the paramedic side of the job as well on, um, education, um, just a, just a very very professional place to work. Uh, that was predominantly, you know, a suburban urban department, um, in terms of the city of Lakewood. Uh, but right on the West side of the West side of our district is, is where you start getting elevation. So, um, you know, wildland and swift water calls and, uh, they run quite a bit of tech rescue calls, uh, rope rescue calls. Um, so it, extremely varied. Uh, right. There. right. Um, Colorado, you know, West Metro was a, uh, a marriage between two older departments, uh, prior to me getting there, they got the, uh, I think West Metro formed up if I recall in 1995. So kind of a young yeah. department, it was made up of two, two departments with history, but a young department in and of itself. And, um, you know, its identity was being a, a professional department, but that's kind of where I would say it's identity. It didn't have a rich tradition. It didn't have a chance to. So we, we pulled stuff from, you know, East, we had East coast influence. We had a lot of West coast influence. Uh, I remember sending, uh, we had sent a number of guys up to the Boise conference one year and uh, brought a lot back from that. Um, so it was, it was kind of a conglomerate, uh, I would say, uh, which was, which was nice. I mean, it was, right. it was good. Kind of pulled what it liked from wherever it found it. Sure. Um, fast forward to West Palm. Uh, West Palm is, uh, I think, the second, hopefully I'm getting that right, the second oldest department in the state. Um, you know, established in 1894. It's a very, it has a ton of, it's a rich tradition. No doubt. Um, old East Coast department, you know, it's a, and it has a little, I think a little more, it starts more on that, that blue collar side. Sure. Um, so yeah, different, you know, different, uh, from department to department for sure. But at the same time, everywhere I've been, I, I've, I could find the same characters, right? You know, the they exact have same a, players. Yeah. All the same players are there. 
I think what's most important, though, is out of all three of those places, you know, rural, suburban, uh, West Palm's an urban, you know, it's a it's a it's kind of like where I grew up. It's like Atlantic City. It's a small town with big city problems, basically. And um, which makes it a great place to work. Um, But all these these very different places and uh, they all have the same thing in common. And, and it's the public. I mean, they all want the same thing. They all right. want us to fix their problem and fix it right away. Right now. Um, that doesn't change. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter the demographics, the socioeconomic status, none of it. It's, it's all the same. That's, that's been pretty interesting. So would you say more the same or different? Um, I would say everything is more the same. More the same. Yeah. I think that's yeah. fair. I, I think the fire service in general is, is pretty much just a, uh, microcosm of our our society in general. So, yeah, I would say more the same. And max points for using the word microcosm. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Garrett Rice has chimed in and said his seconds count class captures one of the most important topics in our business. So, it's Garrett, it's hard to knock, man. Guy. Solid, uh, solid compliment from a solid dude. Yeah, love Garrett. I I think uh, I gotta thank Brush for introducing us. Let's, Okay. I could say that for pretty much anyone. I've kind of ridden Brian's coattails through the first half of my career. There's some so. really good coattails to be on. I can't knock. Yeah, you ab- absolutely. Brian's solid. Uh, yeah, he is. So you teach, and I said, put this in my notes, you teach, and I put dot, 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 a lot. And so mm-hmm. no one can question your passion for sharing knowledge. What do you enjoy the most about it? I'll give you a soft uh, pause here. Yeah, no, my my biggest focus with teaching is I want people to learn uh, earlier in their career, what took me way too long. That's, that's like my biggest focus. It, it, uh, it never should have taken me as long as it did to get, um, as comfortable as I did with, with host work or with forcible entry or any of it. I mean, it it just, it should have been happening from day one. Um, and so my, my biggest goal is I like my favorite student is like, you know, 20 years old. Like, because I, I want them to learn it day one. I want them to know the stuff that took me 10 Dude, years. I love that. That is awesome, yeah, man. That's what to I To have that as a, as a kind of a mantra of, hey, yeah, I'm putting you ahead of the game here. <laughs> yeah. I just, it's, there's no reason for it to take that long. Um, unfortunately, I mean, you know, uh, you know, between IFSTA and NFPA and, and whatever, you know, however your state is set up, our hands are tied so often in terms of curriculum and Sure. You know, you, you got to go, well, you got to learn this, you got to get through these tests and then we'll teach you how we really do it. You know, that, that whole thing, which just drives me nuts. So my, my goal is to teach them what's, uh, what's worked for me. Um, none of it's mine. I mean, all of it is stuff that I've learned from other people and I'm just trying to pass on earlier in their career than I did. So. No, I love that mantra. That is great. Um, and like you said, uh, the, the certifications, the, the, the time requirements, the, the stuff that gets in the way of the actual learning can be so frustrating at times. And you are not alone when you say that. (laughs) No, no, definitely not. All right. So we have Hannah Elliott here and she is the de facto question asker of the weekly scrap. And she says, Ben, what was the biggest contributing factor to how long it took you to get certain aspects of the job? Um, Man, that's good. That's a really good question. Contributing factor. Uh, it was probably my my um, willingness to to seek stuff out. Um, I and I was really. I mean, I was I was into the job from day one. I've been. I've won. I'm that kid that wanted to be the firefighter since you know since he was a little kid. Um, so I was into the job from day one. Um, I, I would say I definitely fell into that that category of like, oh, I got hired by a good department, you know, and so I'm pretty good with what I've been taught here, you know. So the three that three year gap for sure uh was simply being comfortable with what West Metro was teaching me and what I was and and I did learn a lot of good stuff. You know, I was uh Brian and I were fire firefighters together when I first got online. Um, so I had really good mentors. I had, I had all that. Um, but I probably, I would say I probably coasted on that for three years. Uh, and, and 
it was once I once I went to FDIC that really opened my eyes, and then I kind of took my foot off the brake and tried to find everything I could to learn. The other thing is, there just to be honest, there just weren't as many options as there are now. I mean, it, you can't. You know, you throw a dart at a calendar today and you'll hit a conference. No, and, so, and, and a quality conference with quality yeah, instructors yeah. and quality speakers. It's crazy. It's it's unbelievable how much stuff is available. Sorry. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but no, it is. No, you're spot on. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And so really, there's, I'm, God, there's just no excuse not to get out and go get good education and training today. Um, there's the prices are, I mean. You know, when it used to be FDIC was the only game in town or, or the big conferences, everyone knows what FDIC costs. It's, sure. it's extremely expensive to go. Massive. Um, massive. Yeah, it really is. It's a, it's a ton of time. It's a, um, now there's, you know, you could go do a, a two day conference for, for $99 or whatever, 50 bucks at some places get, you know, some of the, the work that the fools chapters around the country are Absolutely. doing for i mean next to nothing for some of the bringing in some of the best instructors in the country oh yeah and howard oh, reinwald who spoke up earlier you know and, and fd tactics yeah and i'm lucky absolutely. enough to be in oklahoma where i can uh catch a lot of their te the texas stuff they do but yeah right. it's just it's crazy how much is available yeah so a lot of it simply wasn't there just wasn't that much the first big group <laughs> which he's ian if he if he's watching the first big group um that I could think of that, that I know of. And that, you know, that was in the Denver Metro area was irons and ladders. And, and those guys are, I guarantee if you're watching are laughing right now, cause they don't think of them, themselves as a big group by any means. Um, and they, they laugh at themselves at what their early classes was, but I took one of their first forcible entry classes. And uh, you know, to this day, they, I mean, they're like, Oh God, that was awful. We didn't know what we were doing. And to this day, it's, it's one of the best fourth century classes I, you know, I've ever been in. I mean, those guys were that good. So right on, um, but they were the only game in town for a while. And then, you know, stuff grew and grew and now it's easy. Now it's easy to go anywhere. No excuses to not catch. No, something. It, really I mean, it really isn't. isn't. And I am Ian. Sorry. Is it Bruzenak? Yeah. Bruzenak. Yeah. Bruzenak. Okay. I just want to say it right, but I'm terrible. I'm awesome but uh, not the point. He said he is watching. So, and the fact, yeah. So, he's a great guy. Uh, I love this question. I've been asking it from uh, uh, every every guest on the scrap. I almost need to put it in the five questions for firefighters. But right now, I just keep throwing it at people, which is, is there anything you've learned uh, in the last 16 years of being a firefighter that a young Ben looking forward would laugh at and say, that will never be me? But now, you know, just the wisdom gained or whatever, however you want to word it. Yeah. And I would never be me. Uh, the, uh, the first, I mean, first off the bat, operationally anyway, um, because I use, because I use it as an example. Uh, if you told me the day I came out of Academy that people would be able to mask up in like five seconds in the future, like <laughs> I, I'm sure there were people back then. Right. It just wasn't all over the internet, but um, I would, I would have called bullshit all day long. Right. I'm like, you know, I was getting out of Academy feeling good. And it was, it probably took me, you know, 40 seconds or whatever. Sure. Um, so to be anywhere around a 10 second mark now, I, I absolutely would have laughed at that. And I would have bet, you know, my pension on it. That, no way. <laughs> not going to happen. Right. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, no. Yeah. Definitely from an operational standpoint, that's, that would be the one. Right on, right on. Um, what insight have you gained from all the instruction that people you've met? What kind of insight have you gained as an instructor? Something you want to pass on to other people who want to instruct kind of deal. Oh, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, th I think the biggest thing is you have to, you just have to recognize I, you asked the question about West, you know, West coast and central and East coast, how are they more alike? Yeah. In general, firefighters are, or the fire services, I would say, uh, more similar than not, but understanding how different everybody's like communities, response models, staffing. Um, it's, I mean, it's massive. It's, it's ridiculous, really. It's ridiculous that our, that our country and as wealthy a, a nation as we are and all that stuff that we have, we have departments with six people on their rigs, you know, and then we have maybe within the same County, uh, people showing up with one and two on a rig. And so they're, I mean, they're, 
they're working two different jobs. Right. No they have the same goal. It. They have the same goal, but they, they are truly going to two different jobs. And uh, so I think if you're going to teach, you, you really have to understand that about your audience. Um, you, you know, and that, that was, uh, that only comes with getting, again, getting outside your bubble and, sure. and get sure. to understand where people are coming from. Uh, put yourselves in their shoes and then, and then adapt. If you have something that still works for them, adapt to it. And if you don't, don't make it up. Right. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't tell them this is the only way to do it or, Oh, we'll do this. You know, right. like no, they're going to see through the BS. Sure. BS so, is gonna die, yeah. 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 If, if you don't have something for them, let them know you don't have like maybe work on it with them, give them an Avenue. I mean, one of the, you know, I, I always like to point out, um, uh, I, I don't know how many people I've, I've tried to push in Gary Lane's direction because Gary Lane's situation in Kent is, is very unique to me. You know, their staffing for the size city they are and the, the population density and all that stuff. Um, I just can't speak to it, you know, and he can. And so it, it just, that's why his class is from the DIY class is phenomenal. And, uh, um, so if I don't have something for them that like, I'm not going to make it up. I'm going to send it to Gary, you know, right on, right it on. just makes more sense. So, um, and then support others. I mean, support other instructors. Uh, don't, you know, none of this is competition. Um, the best instructors I know are not doing this to pad their retirement or anything. Right. They're not getting rich. Uh, they're doing it because they love it. And so, we, we all get the whole fire service gets better together. So support each other, you know, build up these conferences together. And, um, and the, the messages are now starting to get from East coast to West coast, you know, what we're trying to do. So no doubt about it. That's all. Yeah. I have a question from Sean Hazelhurst and he said, should we be teaching masking up with gloves on in an Academy? So there you go. There's a curveball coming at you. Uh, yeah, I, I say absolutely. Um, and in fact, it, that's been something that's changed at West Palm beach. Um, we have a real, we have, uh, uh, a couple of great training captains right now, um, who have very much bought into the importance of, of saving those seconds. And so like just four years ago, when I, when I started with West Palm beach, we did the traditional PPE drills, you know, we did the, you know, f bunker gear first, throw your, throw your SCBA on mask up for time and all that. And I, I get that that's a standard and it's a standard across the country, but it's not how we respond. Right. I, I throw my bunker gear on, then I get on the rig and then I put my air back on and I mask up before I go in. Or, um, I know, I know with Howard watching, you know, there's always discussion about masking up in the rig. In right? the rig right. Um, so that's the but zero now second that's, mask up time videos. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And, and I've, and I'm all for it. If you, if you can make that work, I'm, I will never tell you you're wrong for doing it. Um, but it's changed here. I mean, so our, we have recruits going through right now and they're from day one, they start learning mask up with, with gloves on. And, um, uh, it's, I worked with them the other day doing ladders, uh, talk to, the instructors about uh about their times and they are they're doing great and they're way ahead of like i said my goal is to make sure you're ahead of where i was at that age and they are way ahead of where i was at that age that's awesome uh, so that that's a win my and, and kind of poke at howard here's my response to masking up in in the, <laughs> in the, in the rig. um again i have no problem with it the reason i think we still need to teach masking up with gloves on and still being really fast at mask up is because I, I don't always, you may show up to that, that fire alarm, right. Where you're not masked up because it's came as a fire alarm came as, you know, smells and bells or whatever you want to call it, smoke investigation. Um, and now you have to, or you're coming out of rehab, right. Um, or you were, you were at, there's just times on the fire ground where you don't necessarily have your mask on and you have to transition to it. Even if you started that way in the cap. So, um, so for departments that and guys that are really big on I'm um, masking up in the rig, don't stop doing it, but also be good at at masking up with gloves on. 
hundred percent. That's that's always my my comfort. And and, and a lot of it depends on the the, the brand and style and and make mm-hmm. of what you're wearing because some of them fog up way worse than others. You know when you're wearing them without air blowing. I yeah, know I've had to that, crack my bypass so much just to defog. Right. You know, Those guys, I, I stole their tip. I think I stole it from Brian Olson actually, but doing the, uh, um, I think baby, I use baby shampoo on the inside and you just kind of keep buffing it and right. eventually it won't, it won't, it'll be clear and it won't fog. You have to reapply once in a while, but sure. Sure. Um, there's a couple threads on, on, uh, I think engine company resurrection. ECR, man, you can find anything on ECR. Everything's on there. Yeah. So we were, <laughs> me and a major in my department were talking about, uh, ticks and how you carry them which is like a 60 comment thread going on yeah, right now right. about yeah it was great and so, uh all right uh we got sean hazelhurst said he's the guy who originally asked the question if yep. those recruits can't make your set time are they let go so now you're the chief of the department go right so <clears throat> we because it's new and because we we actually just put our whole department through it last year um, and I think like any time you do a, a big, a big change of, of this nature, um, it, it can't be, uh, can't be punitive from day one. You can't do it that way. It's, it wouldn't be the right way. Um, so for us, it's more, we're using it, uh, and I can't totally speak for the training cadre, but, um, we're using it more as data gathering. So where are we at right now? Here's the goal we want to be at next year. Where do we want to be at in two years? Um, and then th- to me, that's the proper way to implement that kind of change. And from there on, yeah, you set a standard and it becomes like any other standard. You know, you, if you're expected pull pre-connects at 60 seconds at the door, or what, you know, whatever your standards are, sure. that becomes one of your standards period. Um, I just saw a post on the, the search culture page that, uh, uh, Clackamas fire has, has changed theirs down to 15 seconds, wow. you know, which is, and, and they're, the post says they're they're hit their recruits are hitting a hundred you know hundred percent completion rate. Um that's amazing. No, that's a standard but, right there. And, and they did it, they did it right. They started at a higher number. Sure. I think they started at 20 seconds or 25. Um they saw the success. They so they uh, you know, knowing the guys that work there, I'm sure they perfected how they teach it and their methodology. Um they got a bunch of recruits doing it in 15 seconds. I mean it, that's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's awesome. And that'll be their career. Like that, that will become their norm, right. which is what we're trying to do is make our norms, you know, make our, our bar really high for what our norms are, but do it the right way. So. Absolutely. And that ties right in because Garrett, I said, amen earlier to one of your points, but then he also said, and, and I'm telling you when Garrett Rice wrote this, it's actually what I almost interrupted you to say, which was a rising tide floats all ships. And so, yeah. but yeah, it really does. And so it ties right back into it. Chad Daly says, and I'm going to read this here. I believe that coming off rig without a face piece on will almost always lend to a better size up and better communication with whoever in the front yard has knowledge you need of what's going on inside, but to each their own, as long as they're competent. Yeah. I hard I, to argue it, with. It's, it is. And that's right. That's that, that's the, the ongoing Facebook sure. strings and arguments. And that's my approach to it as well. I, I just feel like I, I can take in more and all that stuff um, without the mask on. But again, I would, if people are, are doing their job, they're doing it well, they're not missing things. I, I, I wouldn't take that away from them as a skill. Absolutely. And competence with what you use, whether, I mean, and this is the triple layer, yeah. the minute man, the, the flat load, you know, and all I, that. So I don't, what you, Whatever one you're going to be the most competent with, do it. Just drill with it. Whichever one you're going to use, drill with it and be super competent with it. Agreed. Uh, Chad Daly also said, once they get that good at masking up, we start practicing it while walking. And which is, yep. uh, you know, when our, our, our department a few years ago went through the, let's get our times down as a, as a department, and we did it. And a big thing for me was doing it with gloves on while walking because mm-hmm. as, as the company officer at the time, I'm doing my 360, but also like at the end of that 360, I'm masking up and getting ready to go interior or whatever. So that was a big thing for me was trying to get that time down with the gloves while walking. Sure. So, that's, and that's, that's like a key, <clears throat> that's a key element of, of scientific management, which is uh, basically uh, gaining speed or efficiency, efficiency through step reduction. And uh, which is again, not my stuff. It's not, it's been around since the industrial revolution. So um, one of the key elements of, of scientific management is how many steps can I do um, simultaneously versus sequentially? 
So uh, I, I have a video of, of one of our one of our guys doing a hose stretch, uh, and he uh, he stretches his line out pre connect, gets to the front door, stretches his line out. He calls for water. He masks up. He's he has a fast mask up. He gets masked up in about ten seconds. He from the time he called for water till the time the line was charged, he was already masked up. So because the limiting factor for him making entry into that building is, is that line getting charged? His mask up time essentially is zero, right? right? Cause he did it because he did it time. in the time that the charge took. Right. Ooh, that is nice. So, so the, when you really start looking at stuff like that, you know, zero downtime, simultaneous movements, you know, um, calling for water. Don't wait till you get to the door to call for water. If you, it, like for us, we use a modified minute man, but depending whatever hose load you use, if you're doing a, a Aaron Fields, you know, accordion forward, call for water as you're dumping the hose off the off your shoulder, not after you've stretched it all the way out. Right. Because it takes a little while. Right. All those things, those that's the whole premise of the class is I'm trying to find three seconds here, four seconds there, 10 seconds there. You know, eventually you've 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 given 30 seconds back or a minute back to to both the public and, and for us. So that's. Yeah, the masking up while walking on, walking, masking up while, um, you know, even when you're working with with your partner, you know, if they're handling the stretch, you're masking up. And as soon as they're done the stretch and you're masked up, you can bleed the line. They mask up. Masked it's up. zero zero downtime. Right. And right. That's it's those little things that um, that add up. Just to know. bring it back full circle to every second counts. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Uh, Hannah Elliott chimed in and said, loyal to the best result, which is a chief Walker quote, <laughs> loyal to the best result. I love that. Yeah. All right, here we go. I want to ask you, cause I asked this of every guest I have on the scrap. Do you have a book that you think firefighters should be reading? Uh, yeah, yeah, you, I, I'm so guilty of not, not reading books enough. Okay. Um, I'm really big on articles. That I love a, articles. That is a I firefighter love, thing, not a Vinchel. Yeah. Thing. No, I'm, I'm terrible. I, I hated reading as I was a kid. It took, took till I got to be an adult that I enjoyed it. Um, so I'm big on articles and big on podcasts and stuff. I mostly because I just don't sit still well. So, <laughs> so it's hard to, I have not noticed. Yeah. Um, so, but I will say uh, one of the, the ones that really st- struck me um was on combat would be would probably be one i'd recommend uh early on um or i mean it whenever but if you're a new firefighter get into it early um if, one, if, yeah, if, is, if, is, for people yes. that aren't familiar uh you know it's basically it's written by a guy named dave grossman um and uh, lauren christensen um grossman was a, a ranger and a, a psych professor at, at west point Christensen was a, a retired police officer, um, but it deals predominantly with psychology and physiology of, in their case, deadly conflict, um, you know, war and, and police matters. But uh, really, it's it's about dealing with psychology and physiology, physiology of of extremely stressful situations. Right. So so it carries over really well to what we do. And, and I what I like about it is the operational value of it. Um, and I think it's really important if you don't, if you don't understand how your body, you personally are affected by what we do, then, then a lot of the other stuff you're trying to get better at, um, you're kind of spinning your wheel. Like, yes. I think you have to start with you and then, and start with your mind and, and all that before, um, before you start chasing, you know, chasing other waterfalls. So, uh, I think it's a great place to start to get get to know dude absolutely and then grossman when he talks about the the red zone the black zone and and some of the examples he gives when he gets into the 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 loss of fine motor skills and yep and decision making cognitive all that it's like you said man it really changes your mindset on how you're going to train and what you're going to train on because right once you start understanding when you're in this situation you're not going to be thinking right and that and that i mean that stuff is that absolutely is is some of the material I use to try and support, you know, the 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 idea that time is is our enemy as well, right? Because right. what your body is experiencing and going through, we are not becoming 
higher functioning. Right. I mean, we, are, we are just diving off a cliff. And as we're diving off a cliff, someone's going to hand you a, a unconscious victim. Right. You know? And so the, uh, the faster we, we fix things, the better for everybody. For That's sure. awesome. No, I love it. Great, great, great book uh, from Ben Schultz. So we have a thing we do on the weekly scrap each and every time. It is the five questions for firefighters. Um, it's been fun. I enjoy it. And the points are completely arbitrary and passed out by me. So Perfect. are you ready, Ben Schultz, for the five questions for firefighters? I am. I'm, all right. I've been studying all day. All day long? <laughs> all right. That's a high bar then. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Number one of the five questions for firefighters is what is the number one issue facing the modern fire service? Um, I, I, yeah, I think you could take modern out of it. I think it's just the fire service. I think ego is the, the, honestly, the biggest problem in fire service. It's the biggest roadblock that I, that I've seen, whether I was in California, Colorado, California. Um, I just think it's, it's the root of, of so many of our issues. It's the root of mistrust. It's the root of poor communication. Um, it's, it's the root of, you know, staying in that bubble and not having an open mind to go see what other people are teaching or go learn from somebody else. Um, it's, it's the root of pushing back against the newer generation when they ask you why, because you feel like you're being challenged versus just giving them some info that they're thirsty for. When you want to say, Um, because I said so. Right. I mean, I, I just, I think all of it comes back to ego. Um, and I, I had a good friend, it's a friend of Brian's, uh, um, who was a, I think he's, he's probably still an engineer at, at West Metro, Kyle Bartlett. Um, when I was testing for West Metro, I, I met with, with Brush and, and Kyle and they kind of helped prep me for, uh, um, uh, oral interviews and all that stuff. And, and Kyle, which is still advice I give to, uh, anyone I help out with going through a hiring process at this point. Um, and it's always stuck with me. He, he said, when you go into your interview, you need to figure out how to uh, sell yourself as a humble badass. He's like, that's what we want. We want a humble badass. And I'm like, like he nailed it on the head. That's, that's what the fire service needs to be. Like you need to be really good at what you do uh, operationally. You need to, um, I mean, we have, we have just, we have such a small margin for error. Absolutely. Um, but even when you know you're really good at it, uh, there's gotta be a level of humility there. It's, it's what will lead you to being a better leader. Um, it, it'll keep you as a student throughout the rest of your career. Um, it, it simply make you someone that people actually want to be around also, which I think is important. Dude, uh, I love that. I've never heard who, who was ego. That? Ego. No, 100%. Uh, Kyle, humble yeah, badass. Hum, I love humble that. badass. I may, I may put that on a on a on a uh, uh, a cool picture and put some words to it and say, "Be fire, fire fire service needs more humble badasses." Yeah, and and even uh, more importantly, he uh, he embodied it a hundred percent. I mean, that's that's who he was. He was just one of the most top notch guys I knew, and and just great guy to work with. And no ego in the way. That's awesome, yeah. man. No, great great answer. Yeah. Normally, if you just said ego. Yeah. I would not give it max points because that's like a low hanging fruit, but the, the explanation <laughs> behind it was great. Very much so. And especially the humble badass part. So max points yeah. on question one. Awesome. Very awesome. hard to get max points on the five questions, by the way. So number two, what is the thing you are most excited about for the future of firefighting? Um, I think the, uh, the ability to share information now, and it, it maybe kind of goes a little bit back to, to Hannah's, point earlier you know just the amount of options nowadays is is unbelievable um but the ability to share info is it's just i mean we're we're just kind of ascending at this really steep rate or we have the ability to sure uh departments that are managing it well um are ascending at incredibly steep rates uh others are are kind of like trying to figure it out Um, because along with that info sharing means, you know, and I, I know I'll mess up the, the, the saying, but the whole, you know, we're, we're drowning in information, but starving for knowledge or or something along those lines. 
we are definitely in that, you know, and I wish I could credit to, I don't know who said it originally, but. I would um, give it to brass tacks and hard facts because they use it as their byline. Yeah, they do. that's right. Um, so, uh, yeah, that we are kind of in the age of information in a lot of ways, but de definitely in the fire service. Um, and it is hard to navigate what is out there, but I think it's, it's getting refined. Um, the voices of the instructors are becoming more cohesive. Um, and with social media, uh, with all these conferences, it's just so easy to go learn. It's so easy to go pick someone's brain. It's so easy. We just did a hose study and um, a hose and nozzle evaluation. And like when a question would come up, like I, I can go get on a little group, a little chat group right. and, and talk to 20 of the best, most knowledgeable engine hydraulic, hydraulic guys, guys yes. in the country. You couldn't do that 20 years ago. Right. Um, I'm you not could sure you could do it five years ago. Honestly. No, you're, yeah, you're right. Um, 20 is a huge stretch. I, it, you could go to your neighboring department, right. right? And that's why we had such regionalized firefighting. Right. And that's starting to go away. It's you're starting to, I think we are, we're truly, it's at the beginning of it, but we are moving towards the ability to have best practices throughout the fire service um, and ag agreed upon best practices right. because we're able to have these very large round tables and we're able to do them in this format across the country. Right. Um, so, man, that, that, that makes me extremely optimistic for where we're going. Yeah. Again, uh, I have to give you max points for the explanation, not necessarily the, the original statement, but the explanation was very, very solid. So I'll just, I'll just keep rambling. Keep until talking. I no, the, the explanations are, are phenomenal. <laughs> like the, the, uh, yes, but, and, and, and to your point, even today on engine company resurrection, I think it was, it might've been on FT tax, but Howard, uh, Reinwald, uh, said, you know, there are so many people out there that are, that just aren't vetted. You know, they can, anybody can be on Facebook and put out stuff, yeah. you know, and it's just, and so that's the flip side of what you're talking about. Absolutely. The, yeah. But it's also, we're also getting that peer review almost going on amongst. Yep. So anyway, it's, it's an exciting time. Like you said, very, it is. very good it answer. Is. All right. Moving on. Five questions for firefighters. Question number three, best rank or position to be in, in the fire service. Um, if I, if I looked at that, like if I could only pick one spot or something like that, you know, where if you could pick one spot for your career, it's, it's either, it's a tie for me. Um, I watched Brian's uh, interview on here, you know, whenever that was a few months ago or something, I guess it was February. Um, and he talked about how, you know, working on the heavy rescue at West Metro, we were like the free safety and right. we kind of had to be good at everything. Like that's what I think why he and I, bonded pretty quickly and why we we get along so well is i i don't profess a love to the engine or the truck or uh, i just want to be good at like anything i ever get assigned i want to be good at it when they you call know? your number yeah right. and um so it, it's truly a tie for me it's 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 the nozzle firefighter or a tillerman ovm like those two spots all day i'm gonna be i'm gonna have just the biggest shit eating grin at a good fire <laughs> right on if i'm either on the nozzle right or i'm allowed to go kind of work autonomously and throw ladders and ves and um yeah, yeah like that would those would be the two they're a true tie for me i like I'd be it. happy on either. i like it chad daily timed in and said tillerman 100 <laughs> percent. well no so we have we have our first tiller coming in uh, about a year and a half so it's, they're, it's they're definitely exciting. making a comeback i mean there's I'll be, no I'll doubt be happy about it. if, uh, if i ever um, get different with it I'm going to catch you up before I finish the last two questions. Dave Harm said on combat should be a mandatory read in the Academy. Great selection. Brian Bastinelli said yes with one, two, three, four exclamation points. Eric Devereaux still does in training now. I'm not sure because I don't know exactly what he was talking about. And then of course, Chad uh, Daly said Tillerman. So totally. question four, sorry, I, I usually don't interrupt the five questions for firefighters. Cause I need uh, your focus, too. but uh, question four, best advice you have ever received, which I've already heard a really solid piece of advice in this, but, yeah. I, d I don't know. I've gotten a lot of advice cause I've needed a lot of advice. So, <laughs> um, I don't know that I have best. I have, I probably have two. Okay. If I could give you two. I had, uh, uh, my first, he was actually my first and my last Lieutenant, which was kind of cool at West Metro, uh, a guy named Richie Klein, just 
awesome guy. Um, when I first got to a station, I was, I was fresh out of recruit class and, uh, uh, sat down, brought me in the office, did, did like, here's your expectations, you know, this, that kind of thing, set the, set the tone early. Um, and one of his, I don't, I, I feel bad. I don't remember almost anything he said, but the last, it was like one of the last pieces of, of his expectations was keep small things small. And, um, and I, I, to this day, I still struggle with it. You know, I, I definitely have not mastered that by any means. Um, but I really liked it. I, it, I think keep small things small. It's really easy. Um, uh, especially, you know, you know, the spin up of the, the firehouse kitchen table, right? I mean, it could be the best or the most toxic place in the firehouse. Um, and I think it really applies there. Uh, small it's, small, yeah. it's really important to, as you go through to pick your battles, um, and, uh, and under, and, and see the big picture and like, is, is this worth fighting? Is this worth, uh, pushing, you know, or is this going to be a, a blip on our radar and we're going to move on and let's go put our energy here. Right. And because in 10 years, it's, it's going to make a big difference. And, and not just at the job. I mean, since I've gotten married, since, uh, I have two kids keep small things, small, like that's a, that's that's done a lot for my marriage and for raising kids too. So um, that was a big one. Life wisdom, big... yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I like it, I like it. Okay, you said two, so I'm gonna hold you to it. Yeah, when I was when I was a little kid, this one always sticks with me. Uh, when I was a little kid, I my dad was a uh, a lawyer up in Atlantic City, and um, it was like my first job. I would go work for him when I was like 12. You know, <laughs> like basically put stuff in the the paper shredder for eight hours and he would give me $10. Right. Um, but I remember we were walking to, uh, walking out of his office. We were going to Dunkin' Donuts and, um, there was a, a homeless guy sitting there. Like there are uh, quite a few in Atlantic city. And, uh, he, my dad gave me some money to give to him and I, you know, gave some money to the guy. And, uh, I kind of, I talked to my dad about it a little bit and like, well, you know, why are, why are we helping him or that, you know, just kind of a little back and forth. And my dad's, my dad's whole thing was, all right, you know, our job is not to judge. It's just to help. And if there was anything that set the tone in terms of the career and the, the way I hope I'm living my life or trying to live my life, um, that's, that's kind of it. Our job's not to solid. judge. It's just, to, just to help. Especially so. if your department makes medical rides. I mean, if you go, yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's a. If you keep it, that forward in that brain, that'll help with your morale, your attitude, everything. Yeah, it does. It does. It's that that little piece of advice gets gets me through a lot of things. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Both pieces of advice. Very nice. Okay. Number five. Final question of the five questions for firefighters. You have heavy fire, and you have tenable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Oh well, that's question three. <laughs> I wondered because you kind of said it earlier. <laughs> I love them both, man. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that that's a toss up. I'm, you'd, I'd be winning either way. I, I really wouldn't be able to pick. So that's why it's such a great question. So it, it really, I guess, uh, it, if I have to lean towards one, I mean, no man. one's turning away either one. I get it. No, they're great. I like the amount of, uh, I like the multiple skills that go into VES. You know, sure. Um, I, so I, I think it's a little more choreographed. I'd probably go with that. Okay. So, yeah. Fair. I can't knock it, man. There it is. The five <laughs> questions for firefighters, according to Ben Schultz. Thank you, sir. It was very fun. Oh, I loved uh, it. it best great. place to get a hold of you if someone wants to get in touch with you. Uh, yeah. Um, Facebook's easy. Okay. Um, that's um, I don't do any other social media. Uh, I don't. Uh, I keep it pretty simple, but yeah, Facebook, shoot me a message on there. Um, or you could do it through the fire by trade, uh, Facebook page. Okay. Um, got a message, shoot it over. I'll get back to you. Anything you got coming up, anything you want to plug, anything going on? I mean, with 2020, everything's been crazy, it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I have, uh, there's two things that I already had on the books before all this started. Uh, so still, you know, trying to honor that stuff. So I'll be at, um, the fire ground commander, uh, conference, Ben Martin's conference up in Virginia. Nice. Um, that'll be in March. 
So, uh, and I'll be doing the, the every second counts up there. Nice. Really looking forward to that. Uh, awesome lineup up there. And then um, FDIC, uh, assuming all that goes off, uh, there's a, we do a primary search class, uh, uh, one of the hot classes. It's a, this will be the, I think it's the fourth year to be my third year, fourth year that the program's been going. Um, and that's a group of firefighters uh, from Florida, Ohio, um, Washington, Colorado, Virginia, that make up the cadre. It's a really fun cadre to work with. And, uh, we've enjoyed doing that one. So awesome. those are the only, the only two. I have a couple potential ones, but I'm, I'm not committing anything new until, uh, until COVID kind of. Until we get some more out. clarity, a more yeah. clarity going yeah. forward. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to catch you up yeah. here because we got a few more comments coming. Steven Johnson said, nice job, Ben. Miss you. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Uh, great guy. Brian Brush. The man himself said, did Richie give you that speech before or after we left you at the station to go to a fire? That's true. That, that was uh day. That would have been before. That was day, uh, maybe my second day on the job. Um, went to get a shower. And uh, the showers at the time had, the uh, bathrooms had no uh, speakers in them. Nice. So you'd never hear the tone. I can see where this ends. So I, I come out of the shower and all the, the rigs are gone. And I'm like, ah, they're, I, they, they're just screwing with they're me. Just you know? <laughs> and then, so I run over to the, the old dot matrix printer, you know, they'll rip and run. Uh, oh no, structure fire. Awesome. Nice. I just, I just lost my job. Great. <laughs> <laughs> this is on top of day one. I had gotten in a, I had gotten in a fight with a shoplifter at the grocery store. <laughs> so like, so it's a it was, good day. I was, I was off to a, a stellar start there. I think it's actually why Richie liked me for at least at the beginning. At the beginning. Uh, LJ guys chimed in and said, our job is not to judge. Our job is to help. Man, that is solid. I agree with you. I love that. Uh, John Spira yeah. said, V-E-S. Can't knock it. <laughs> uh, Garrett Rice said, great interview. Such a gentleman. You're getting the compliments, my friend. Dave Harms. Gary Lane is the questions champion, Ben. Yeah. So. These, these guys are – these are – these are all your, oh, okay. You got your, you should your be, chops busted here. Yeah. You should, I mean, you should be interviewing all of them instead of me anyway. These I will get a list. I'll get a list started. Yeah. Now, I was going to get uh, this whole, the whole plan for this scrap was just going to be nothing but dirt on Brian Brush. <laughs> so, but. well, the problem is, I mean, this, you have to have a rating on it. Right. You know, it's got to be R or X or something. I mean, and now he's a chief, so I can't, I can't say anything. To, it's hard because that white helmet. Shame on, yeah right on um we'll we'll meet up in person sometime and that's fair it'll 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 go south quick <laughs> well brother i can't say i've had a good time i mean it, it's been a pleasure yeah uh, no this is awesome being Great. guest number 57 the five questions for firefighters the books of course talking about all your experiences and your passion there is no doubt um <laughs> That uh, Garrett, I got to read you the last one. Garrett Rice said, Ben, say goodnight to Brian's mom for us. And, uh, oh, uh, Lord. All right. Sorry. I had to read that one. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, coming up on the scrap, uh, the rest of December or rest of November is looking good. Next week, Sean Duffy and then Andy Starnes, Howard Reinwald. I'm finally getting him on here. Uh, awesome. LJ Geist, who was in this one tonight asking some questions, is coming up to kick off December. Mike Heaney, Brian, uh, Bobby Halton, sorry, Walter Lewis, and Dave Heaney. He said, that's all coming up in the next eight weeks or so. So it's going to be a, a cram-packed time. This was number 57 with Ben Schultz. It is in the books. Thank you so much for coming on, sir. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. This was great. Thank you, everybody, for the questions, comments, and busting Ben's chops. And uh, it was a good time. I hope the tone stays silent for everyone. Unless it's burning, stay safe out there. <laughs>